Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Jeffords, an orthopedic spine surgeon and co-medical director of Resurgeon Spine Center in Atlanta, Georgia. If you are someone who is suffering from lower back and radiating leg pain, numbness, or weakness, symptoms otherwise known as sciatica or radiculopathy, you may be one of the thousands of people each year who suffer from spinal stenosis, or narrowing of the spinal canal caused by disc bulging and joint arthritis. You may also have a degenerative spondylolisthesis, a condition where one of the bones in your spine begins to slip forward on top of the bone below due to instability of the spinal joints. What I would like to do in this video is to explain what these conditions are, review the treatment options, and answer many of the commonly asked questions about stenosis and spondylolisthesis. In order to understand what these conditions are, it helps to begin with an understanding of the anatomy of your lower back. The spinal column consists of 33 bones called vertebra that are stacked one on top of the other. In the lumbar spine, there are five of these vertebra, labeled L1 through L5. The L5 is at the bottom and sits above the sacrum, or tailbone. In between each of these vertebra, there are spinal discs, which serve as cushions or shock absorbers for the spine. The disc between L4 and L5 is called the L4-5 disc. The bottom disc is called the L5-S1 disc. Behind the column of bone and disc is the spinal canal, which is formed by a series of bony arches called lamina that are each attached to their corresponding vertebra by columns of bone called pedicles. Each arch sequentially hooks onto the one below on either side, slightly behind and to the sides of the spinal canal. Where these arches hook together, they form a pair of joints called facet joints. Running through the spinal canal is the spinal cord, which runs down from the brain and comes all the way down and stops at the first lumbar vertebra. Below L1, there is no longer a spinal cord, only nerves that have branched off the spinal cord. Sometimes these spinal nerves are called nerve roots because they look like roots branching off of a tree trunk. These nerves travel down through the remainder of the spinal canal contained within a sac of spinal fluid. At each disc level, a pair of these spinal nerves, one on each side, exits from the spinal canal and radiates down the legs to supply the muscles, joints, and skin throughout the legs and feet. The spinal nerves exit from the spinal canal through tunnels called foramen that are bordered by the disc in front and the facet joints in the back. Degenerative conditions of the spine caused by aging can lead to progressive narrowing of the spinal canal or narrowing of the individual nerve tunnels, called foramen. Another word for this narrowing is stenosis. When the spinal canal is narrowed, it is typically referred to as central stenosis. When the individual nerve tunnels, or foramen, are narrowed, it is called foraminal stenosis. There are basically three components of spinal degeneration that lead to stenosis disc degeneration and disc bulging, facet joint arthritis and bone spur formation, and ligament thickening. As we age, our discs will slowly begin to degenerate or wear out. This process usually begins in our 30s and is part of the normal aging process, just like our hair turning gray. This process happens in all of us, but in some people it may progress at a faster rate or start at an earlier age. As this occurs, the disc starts to dry out and slowly shrinks and flattens. The outer wall of the disc will eventually start to bulge and may impinge on the spinal nerves within the spinal canal or the nerves exiting through the foramen. As the disc provides less and less shock absorption, the facet joints start to see more and more stress. As a result, the facet joints may begin to develop arthritis, a condition also known as spondylosis. With facet joint arthritis, the joints get larger and also form bone spurs. The enlarging joints and bone spurs can contribute to the spinal canal narrowing. Lastly, there is a ligament that runs along the inside of the spinal canal, just underneath the lamina, connecting one of the lamina to another. This ligament is called the ligamentum flavum. Spinal degeneration can lead to thickening of this ligament, which also leads to stenosis. Stenosis can cause leg pain in two ways. First, the bulging discs and bone spurs that cause the spinal canal to narrow can lead to mechanical pressure on the spinal nerves. Secondly, the local inflammation that results from the joint arthritis and disc degeneration can cause the nerve roots to become very irritated and inflamed, which is more of a chemical reaction. Both the mechanical pressure on the nerves and the chemical irritation 
can lead to nerve inflammation and problems with how the nerve root functions. The combination of the two can cause pain, weakness, and numbness in the area of the body to which the nerve supplies sensation. Some of the treatments for stenosis only affect the chemical irritation, while others can affect both. Back and leg pain can also be caused by instability of the spine, where one bone begins to slip forward on top of the one below. This condition is called spondylolisthesis. In general, there are two types of spondylolisthesis, degenerative spondylolisthesis and ismic or lytic spondylolisthesis. In this video, we will focus on the degenerative form of spondylolisthesis. The same degeneration of the discs and joints that can lead to stenosis can also result in instability. Arthritis of the facet joints can cause these joints to become unstable, leading to the progressive slipping of the one vertebra forward on top of the one below. When this occurs, it can exacerbate back pain and lead to increasing stenosis. Before going into the treatment options for stenosis and spondylolisthesis, it is important to understand what happens if you do nothing. Physicians call what happens when you do nothing the natural history. It is important to realize that a lot of people that are not experiencing back or leg pain are walking around with stenosis or a spondylolisthesis, and that these conditions do not always cause symptoms. When you do experience pain from stenosis, in some cases it may be a temporary flare-up, and the symptoms can resolve on their own, without specific treatment. If this happens, it is not because the stenosis has gone away. Because stenosis is caused by degenerative conditions, it generally will slowly progress and increase in severity over time. In some patients, the stenosis increases at a faster rate than others. Despite the fact that many patients with stenosis do not need treatment, there are instances when stenosis can cause significant neurologic dysfunction. Generally, the more severe the stenosis, the more severe the symptoms. In some cases, stenosis can cause such severe nerve compression that it can result in significant muscle weakness in the leg and foot. The longer this muscle weakness remains present, the higher the chances that the leg weakness could become permanent. Fortunately, this is rare. Another rare condition is called cauda equina syndrome. This occurs when severe spinal stenosis or a very large disc herniation causes severe compression of all of the nerves running through the spinal canal, including the nerves that supply the bladder and bowels. When this occurs, it can cause loss of control of the bowel and bladder function, leading to incontinence. This is considered to be a surgical emergency, and urgent surgical removal of the disc herniation or stenosis is needed in these circumstances. Treatment for stenosis can generally be broken into three separate phases of treatment. Phase one includes non-invasive treatments, phase two includes spinal injections, and phase three is surgery. Having a spondylolisthesis does not necessarily change that treatment strategy, unless surgery is required. Remember that the discs and joints do not have the ability to regenerate, and that arthritis and stenosis cannot be reversed. Therefore, the treatments are aimed at reducing symptoms. The goals of treatment for each phase should be to relieve pain and improve function. Phase one of treatment consists of non-invasive options, including oral medications, physical therapy, home exercises, and local ice and heat. In most cases, these treatments are prescribed based on your symptoms and physical examination alone, before confirming the actual presence of stenosis with an MRI scan. The medications may include steroids, which are powerful anti-inflammatories, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, and pain relievers, such as Tylenol. The medications do not reverse the spinal canal narrowing or arthritis but instead reduce the chemical irritation of the nerves that are pinched by blocking inflammation. Physical therapy involves specific back exercises that strengthen your back, reducing the stress on the discs and the joints. If your radiating leg pain fails to improve with physical therapy and medications, an MRI scan is required to confirm the presence of stenosis before proceeding to phase two. Phase two of treatment for stenosis is lumbar epidural steroid injections. These are outpatient procedures where steroid medicine is injected into the spinal canal using x-ray guidance. The steroid medicine is injected right over the pinched nerves and the steroid medicine blocks the inflammation of the nerves, hopefully allowing the symptoms to resolve and eliminating the need for surgery. Sometimes more than one injection is needed and a series of two or three injections given over a six to 12 week period may be required. The injections may be performed by a spine surgeon but are more commonly performed by non-surgical spine specialists called physiatrists, 
or by anesthesia pain specialist. Phase three of treatment for stenosis is surgery. If epidural steroid injections have failed to provide significant relief of leg pain, surgical treatment may be required. In some cases, patients have such severe leg pain or weakness that surgery is offered and injections are bypassed. The surgical options for treating stenosis include laminectomy, partial laminectomy, which is also called laminotomy, and foramenotomy. These surgical techniques all involve removing some portion of the bone spurs, bulging discs, and thickened ligament tissue that are pressing on the nerves. The different names just describe what portion of the anatomy is going to be removed. Most surgeons group these three procedures under the term laminectomy. A laminectomy can be done through a traditional open incision or through smaller incisions using special retractors, a procedure called minimally invasive lumbar microdecompression. Minimally invasive techniques can provide the advantages of smaller incisions, less muscle tissue damage, and a quicker recovery. If you have a spondylolisthesis and are a candidate for surgery, your surgeon may also recommend that you have a spinal fusion. Performing a laminectomy of a spinal level that has a spondylolisthesis will in many cases cause the slip to worsen after the surgery, leading to persistent or recurrent back and leg pain. Patients who have a significantly unstable spondylolisthesis tend to have better results if a fusion is performed. Spinal fusion can also be done using a minimally invasive technique called MIST lift. In summary, lumbar spinal stenosis and degenerative spondylolisthesis are common conditions. In many cases, they cause minimal or temporary symptoms and oftentimes do not need specific treatment. In cases where stenosis and spondylolisthesis cause significant leg pain, medications and therapy are usually effective. Epidural steroid injections are sometimes needed and in a small percentage of patients, surgery is required. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You may have additional questions, and if so, you may want to consult with your spine physician.